but this is a great one. Now, often it's the gifts of the Magi, right? The gold, frankincense, and myrrh that we focus on. Uh, and there's no question that in America, at least, it is the giving of gifts, it's the receiving of gifts that gets the most time and money and energy at Christmas, right? Probably no argument from any of us on that. Sometime during December, there was a Sunday school teacher in a church who wanted to ask her class, these were fifth or sixth graders, I think, um, to fill in the statement, Christmas is dot, dot, dot. One of the little girls in the class immediately shot up her hand, so the teacher called on her, and the little girl said with great confidence and with exuberance, Christmas is presents. The teacher smiled at her and said, very good, Katie, and she walked over to the board and she, she wrote it on the chalkboard. P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E. Christmas is all about the presence of God, about God coming to be with us in the person of baby Jesus. And the little girl said, that's not how you spell it. That's not what I meant. Christmas is presents, you know, gifts. It's, it's all about getting presents. Having lived through this past week when I would venture to guess that most of us have spent a fair amount of time giving and receiving gifts, we shouldn't be too quick to criticize the little girl for her bluntness. I sometimes wonder if the truth were known, how many Christians in America think that the best part of the Christmas season is the receiving and or the exchanging of gifts. I also wonder sometimes if we would ever dare to celebrate Christmas, if even just for one single year, without giving or receiving a single gift. I wonder if I could do that. Do you think you could do that? In many countries, but particularly in South and Central America, December 25th is not the day when gifts are exchanged. Many children in Colombia and Mexico and other Latin American nations don't get their presents until Epiphany, January 6th, 12 days after Christmas. There's a song about that. January 6th is celebrated as Three Kings Day. It's called El Dia de los Tres Reyes Majos. Not bad for a German. <laughs> it's the day that commemorates the Magi presenting their gifts to the Christ child. God has another gift in store for us today. It's the gift of his word. So let's honor the tradition of our brothers and sisters in Nicaragua and Honduras and wherever, wherever else they do this. And uh, let's open the gift of God's word and let's look at this story of the Magi. Verses 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. 
And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my words shall never pass away. Thanks be to God. But we really don't know all that much about these magi. Uh, notice uh, that the text doesn't say that there were only three of them. Historically, we've kind of assumed that because it tells us there were three gifts. But there could have been an entire caravan of magi. We know there was a caravan because they probably came with servants and helpers and whatnot, but there could have been much more than just three magi. According to the best biblical and historical scholars, scholars uh, the magi were representatives of a priestly caste or caste of Zoroastrians. That's a religion uh, that still exists today. It was very common, maybe still is common, in what was then Persia, but is now Iran and Iraq. They specialized in dreams and in omens, and the first century historian Herodotus tells us that they were also, uh, they claimed the gift of prophecy, many of them. But their primary interest was in reading the stars. They were astrologers. Now, astrology has nothing to do with Christianity or with Judaism, for that matter. In fact, actually, it is a form of spiritual direction that is opposed in the scriptures, and it is akin uh, to divination and witchcraft. So it's not something that's uh, applauded in the scriptures by any means. But today, we see that these magi, these astrologers, are lifted up as examples of faith. And I thought, that's strange. Why is that? Three things came to my mind this week that I'd like to share with you this morning. First of all, the magi were passionate seekers. And I don't mean passionate in the way that Hollywood uses the term. I'm talking about passion as the deep and insuppressible uh, affection of the soul. It's what sets your heart on fire. Mozart had a passion for classical music. Martin Luther had a passion for personal religious freedom. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a passion for civil rights. We could go on and on with people throughout history that have given their lives to their passion. It is the overwhelming desire and yearning of the human spirit for something greater than itself. One theologian calls it the essential passion of the human condition, the search for something to truly believe in. That's good to think about. So here's the question. What would you say is the passion of your life? Where and when and for what are you most passionate, truly passionate. The profession of these magi involved them in searching for answers to life's questions. That's what astrologers, philosophers, wise men strive to do. They search for explanations as to the meaning and the, the direction and the destiny of human beings, and including the relationship of human beings to the divine however people choose to, to def define that. But these particular magi were moved and led in a different way than most pagan astrologers and magi, soothsayers and charlatans and all the rest. Pagan astrologers, both before them and after them, typically sought to decipher the ways of God and of men without a revelation from above without a revelation from God. They would just try to come up with it on their own. But these wise men had a revelation from God. They'd been given a star to follow, not to merely marvel at and to study, to follow. And with the revelation of that heavenly sign, the Magi became passionate to find the new king to whom it pointed, and that's why they set out looking for him. 
They wanted to know, they were passionate to know the truth about Jesus. And, and they didn't even know that was his name until they got there. I don't suppose many of us have ever traveled any distance by camel. Let's assume that that's the mode of transportation that they used to get from wherever they started to Bethlehem. I rode a camel once. It was a hoot. Uh, it was at a carnival uh, in 1967 in Montreal, the World's Fair. I was a boy of 10 years old. It was fun. It was a two-humper. It was great fun. But I cannot imagine doing what these magi did, crossing scorching sands, blistering winds, desert wilderness, to make a journey like this. As far as we know, these wise men came from as far away as Babylon, which would have been a journey of about 1,300 miles to Bethlehem. Now, that's like taking a trip from here to Santa Fe, New Mexico, on the hump of a camel. I tell you, these guys must have had a passion for the, this uh, king, or they never would have set out in the first place. I mean, put yourself in the Magi's shoes a moment, or whatever it was they wore on their feet. You've come all of this way across searing sands and blistering heat, living out of a saddlebag, and you come with great expectation for what you're going to see. So you come to this little house, this modest house, we presume. They weren't people of, of a lot of wealth, nor was their family, as far as we know. Maybe it was only just a part of a house. They're living with extended family, which was very common in those days. But you get there, and you see where Mary and Joseph are living with now their one and only son. The Magi could have looked at all of that, looked at the Holy Family, and said, no way. This can't be it. We better keep looking. But they didn't do that. Instead, they went into worship and to adore and to present their gifts because they were passionate for the truth and they would have it no other way. Secondly, let's notice that these men were humble worshipers. The word humble comes from a Latin word, homur, which means literally earth. Humble not only means lowly, it also means literally down to earth. It takes genuine humility, doesn't it, to fall to the earth in front of another person. And these men fell to their faces in front of a baby. Could you do that? Could we do that today? You might say, well, out of a sense of duty, out of a sense of obligation, begrudgingly. But could we do it passionately? That's what these men did. And mind you, these were men of great education. These were the elite of their society. These were men of great wealth and status and prominence. They had just gained an immediate audience with King Herod in Jerusalem. And not just anybody did that. And the gifts that they presented were not cheap. Gold, frankincense, myrrh, costly gifts. But verse 11 says, on coming to the house, they saw the child with, with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. I remember being very touched, very moved, one Christmas Eve. This was 1998, when I was on staff at Christ Memorial Church in Holland. The church was doing their annual Christmas pageant. Uh, in which they told the Christmas story uh, with actors, members of the church, uh, fully dressed in wonderful costumery, uh, wonderful attire. At one point in the drama, the entire cast of characters, we're talking about dozens of people now, some of the villagers of Bethlehem, but the shepherds, the magi, even Joseph and Mary, 
all fall prostrate around the cradle, the manger of baby Jesus. In one moment, every single adult on the stage and on the main floor before the stage fell with their faces to the ground and stunning silence prevailed over the audience. And I thought to myself, now this is the way that we should respond as true believers. This will be the response of true believers. And I thought, when we truly understand who Jesus is, this is what we will do. We will humble ourselves. Because every knee ultimately will bow and every tongue confess, he is the Lord. When we come to know that he is the king of life, that he is the only savior for sin, we will worship him. We will adore him and we will be overjoyed to give him his due, to give him the glory that he deserves. And when I wrote that in my notes, I thought, what's the connection between humility and joy? Is there a connection between those two? Do you think it's possible that many Christians in America today do not know the fullness, the abundance of the joy of the Lord because they are not humble before him? Is that possible? Let me tell you something that ought to really humble us. Jesus declared in John chapter 4, A time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for such the Father seeks to worship him. Now don't miss that last phrase, the Father seeks. God is seeking people. He's seeking you. Let's put it in past, present, and future tense. God has been seeking you. God is seeking you. God will be seeking you. How can I know that? Well, how is it that the Magi were looking specifically for the king of the Jews? How did they know? How is it that they recognized this one star, this one unique shining star amidst all the gazillions of stars in the sky as pointing to this king? How could they correctly understand and discern all of that? Honestly, I don't know. I can't explain it. All I know is what the scripture says. All I know is that God was seeking them and he was revealing himself to them. Do you know, my friend, that our God is a revealing God? He's the great revealer of mysteries. He's the great revealer of all things. He reveals himself in the creation around us. Look at this gorgeous blanket of snow, never mind the trouble it causes us. Look at the beauty of the creation. God reveals himself through prophets and apostles and evangelists and those who bear witness and give testimony to him. He does so through the inner promptings of his Holy Spirit. He does it through dreams and visions. He does it through the pages of Holy Scripture. But the perfect, the true, the complete revelation of Almighty God was in the person of his only Son, Jesus Christ. God is a revealing God because he wants to be known. Because he wants to be in a relationship with us. It's always been that way. From the time that he fashioned Adam and Eve and blew his spirit into them, it was about that relationship. And he wants us to worship him. And that's what the Magi did, very humbly. They worshiped. They were, first of all, passionate seekers. They were humble worshipers. Lastly, they were also believing strangers. The traditional story of the Magi says that these men were strangers from the East. We three kings of Orient are, as we sang. Friends, it is no small thing and it is no mere coincidence that God welcomes strangers from a distant land 
from a foreign nation to the cradle throne of his son. Remember that these strangers were Gentiles. In fact, these are the very first people in Scripture to receive, non-Jewish people, to receive the revelation of Christ, which is what the word epiphany means, the revelation to the Gentiles. Dr. Samuel Larson, who is a professor of missions at Reformed Theological Seminary, says this, and I quote, Elsewhere in Scripture, the mixing of God's people, the Jews, with the pagan Gentiles that are represented by these men, the Magi, is consistently condemned, but not so in this story. Why? It's because God is doing a new thing here. The birth of Jesus the Messiah, Larson says, is a profound missionary event. It tells us that God's redemptive plan includes the gathering of the nations at the feet of his son. The coming of the Magi is also a missionary event. It is God's grace reaching out to the nations and drawing people to himself through his son. End quote. Friends, God is still reaching out today to draw all people to himself, to draw you to himself, because he is an unrelenting seeker of human souls. God wants you. He wants you. He's the great shepherd who seeks to Find and recover his sheep. Listen to these words from Ezekiel chapter 34, 11 and following. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look for them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on days of cloud and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak, says the Lord. Christ came as the good shepherd. He says that of himself in John chapter 15, that he is the good shepherd. He goes after the lost people of the world. Jesus said in in Luke 19, 10, the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, do you suppose it matters to God how lovely or how nice the sheep are? Do you suppose God looks any harder for white sheep than for gray sheep or brown sheep or black sheep or, if there were such a thing, green sheep? Does he search more diligently for healthy, fluffy sheep than he does for sick, mangy sheep? No. He looks for all of his sheep. He wants all of them to be saved. He wants you to be saved. So this story of the Magi, friends, is much more than a story about a bunch of rich guys bringing nice gifts to Jesus to pay for their trip to Egypt. This is the good news of the gospel. And listen, if magi from the east are welcomed at the throne of Jesus, then so are you. So are you. And so are all of those around us here in the Grove and in Jamestown Township. There's a story told by a Christian layman which I think accurately expresses the truth of God's grace and of God's gift and the faith that it takes to accept it. Permit me to share a portion of a dialogue written in Keith Miller's book, The Habitation of Dragons. One evening, several years ago, I was talking, uh, taking a friend out to dinner. We had eaten in a cafeteria when a good-looking woman sauntered up to our table. I recognized her as a member of the large Sunday school class I was teaching at church. Her name was Susan, and we began to talk. After about 40 minutes, she said almost wistfully, I believe that you have really found hope in your faith. And I would honestly like to make a commitment of my life to Christ, but I can't. 
Why not, I asked. Because I've got a personal problem that I can't seem to resolve. She was biting her lip and looking down at a paper napkin she had folded into a small square. I said to her, but Susan, that's why Christianity is called good news. We can't solve our basic hang-ups and problems. I can't promise to change anything. All I can do is accept God's love and his forgiveness. But, she said, and she hesitated, I don't feel acceptable until I whip this problem. Listen, Susan, I said. The old song doesn't say just as I am when I whip my major problems. It says just as I am without one plea, without one promise or guarantee. And she looked at me with the strangest dawning look of hope. And she said, do you really believe that? And I said, I'd bet my life on it. All right, she said, almost as a challenge. I'm committing adultery every Thursday night with a married man, and I can't quit. Now can I come into your Christian family? I just looked at her for a moment. I certainly hadn't expected that. My first preconditioned reaction as a churchman would be to think, well, she is not ready for Christ. But suddenly I realized how phony we church people can be. Of course we would expect her to quit committing adultery. But we really don't mean just as I am, without one plea. What we mean is just as I am when I promise to straighten up my act, get my act together, and whip my major sins. This woman had nailed me with her honesty. She knew in her heart that she did not have the strength to quit sinning. And yet it was Susan's weakness. It was her own need for Christ that had brought her to the church in the first place. I'll end Miller's reading, or writing there. But the point is that Susan, because of her sin, felt like she was a stranger to God and thus had to be a stranger to God's people and God's word and God's ways and all the rest. Susan didn't understand that the coming of Jesus Christ to the world was a missionary event. It was for her and for every sinful and sinning person on the planet. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, reconciling you to himself. It was for you he came and died and rose again. So friends, we need to reframe the entire story of Christmas in our minds as an evangelistic outreach of our Creator. We need to see everything about the life of Jesus as serving just one purpose, to save lost people. And listen, those whom God saves, he also calls. He calls to become seekers. Not just seekers of him, but also seekers of lost people. Like Susan. How many Susans are there living in Forest Grove today? God's plan is to bring strangers and seekers together. Maybe it won't happen in this house. Maybe it'll happen in your house. Strangers and seekers coming together because they both want to know Christ. Who is this man? So what about us here at Forest Grove Reformed Church? What can we say of ourselves? What are we committed to doing and to being next year? That's a question that our vision team has been meeting since the middle of October, thinking about, praying about, and discussing in earnest. And we're waiting for God. And we don't have his revelation yet, but we know our God is a revealing God, and he's going to speak it into our lives at some point in time. But we need you to pray with us, and we need you to pray for us, that we'll get that clearly in his time and in his way. 
But what are we committed as a congregation to do and to be in 2018? We could probably answer that in a lot of different ways. We have at our vision team meetings. But let me suggest to you, coming from our text this morning, that since God is in the business of welcoming strangers, that maybe the first order of business for us should be to commit ourselves to being a welcoming congregation, a hospitable congregation, a receiving, invitational, accepting, loving, no conditions congregation. What would that look like? People with mohawk, blue mohawk hairdos up to here and more tattoos and piercing than we can name and people that smell so bad you don't want to stand within six feet of them walking through the doors and saying, is this a place where I can worship God? And we put our arm around them and we say, you bet. Where would you like to sit? You want to sit with me? Can we do that? Strangers and seekers together. Brothers and sisters, I am convinced that God wants us to be in the business of bringing Christ to this community and to this world. And we can do it because the Bible says, Jesus said, that with God all things are possible. So is that true? You bet it is. And I can't wait to see what 2018 looks like at Forest Grove Reformed Church. Amen. For our closing prayer, I want to have the deacons come up. So uh, those of you who are collecting today, if you want to just come on up with the plates, let's prepare to give our tithes and offerings, please. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we stand on the brink of another new year, we look back and we consider the countless ways in which you've blessed us. Lord, move upon our hearts just now as you did the Magi of old and help us to present our gifts with hearts that are full of joy, full of adoration. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus, whose gift and sacrifice of himself can never be measured, never be equaled. Lord, we bring our gifts to you now in his name, and we ask you to use these offerings and to use us for your glory and for your kingdom, that it would come to earth, that it would come to the grove, that it would come to Jamestown Township, that it would come to people like Susan who want to know Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.